Foreshadowing is used in plots to give a warning or indication to audiences of what's to come, and it's used in Star Trek quite frequently. Sometimes it can be used in a very obvious way. For example, look at the scene from the Star Trek Discovery episode Light and Shadows, where Arium gets infected with a virus in her cybernetic brain. As she analysed the computer breach on her screen, a bunch of flashing red lights appeared, and as the camera cut to her face, she was obviously under some sort of trance from it. This clearly set up the plot line of her getting infected by control and forced to betray Discovery. Instead, this list will be focusing on moments of foreshadowing that many people may not have noticed, either casual conversations that seem random at first but later get revisited in a big way, or story plots that don't get fully resolved until several episodes later. So with that in mind then, I'm Ellie with Trek Culture here with 10 moments of Star Trek foreshadowing you never noticed. Number 10. Pike's Chat with Dr. Boyce The Talosians from the original series pilot episode The Cage possess some of the most advanced telepathic abilities we've seen in the franchise. Among other abilities, they can search through the memories, fears and desires in someone's mind and make them appear real through complicated illusions. During the scene in Pike's quarters, he talked to Dr. Boyce about what was on his mind. He was thinking a lot about a battle on Rigel 7, specifically when he was trapped in a deserted fortress fighting an enemy warrior. In the same scene, he told Boyce that he longed to return to his home, a beautiful town surrounded by miles of parkland where he used to ride horses in his youth. Then he thought aloud about how his life would have gone if he had decided, for example, to live on a world like Orion rather than joining Starfleet. Later, when the Talosians captured him, these three thoughts were turned into reality. He first appeared back on Rigel 7, then at his old idyllic home on Earth, complete with horses, and finally in a fantasy where he lived on Orion. This scene in Pike's quarters was a brilliant bit of foreshadowing that illustrates to audiences how the Talosians are able to scan someone's mind and recreate their thoughts. Number 9. The War Between the Borg and Species 8472 the Voyager episode Scorpion introduced Species 8472, an empire of highly intelligent three-legged aliens from another dimension known as Fluidic Space. When the Borg first encountered Species 8472, they predictably tried to assimilate them, but the unique biology of life in Fluidic Space made this very difficult. Species 8472, under attack by the Collective, began a long, brutal war against them and all other life in the Milky Way galaxy. It was very interesting to watch the Borg go against such a powerful force. At this point, the Borg had never been threatened this much by any species. What you may not know is that the invasion of Species 8472 was actually foreshadowed a few episodes prior. In the episode Unity, Voyager encountered a damaged Borg cube in space. When investigating the cube, the crew began to speculate that it was disabled by an attacker, which really surprised everyone because they couldn't imagine an empire more powerful than the Borg. They never found out who the attackers were in the episode, but Brannon Braga, a writer of Voyager, confirmed in issue 28 of Star Trek Monthly that the events of Unity were explained in Scorpion, heavily implying that the attackers were Species 8472. Number 8. Lorca's True Origin Immediately when Captain Gabriel Lorca was first introduced in Star Trek Discovery, it was clear that he wasn't a typical Starfleet captain. Many fans criticised him for being too militaristic, disregarding the Tardigrades' rights to have the upper hand against the Klingons. Eventually though, these complaints were put to rest when it was revealed that Lorca was actually an imposter from the Mirror Universe. Throughout the beginning of Season 1, Lorca was constantly putting medication in his eyes. He claimed that it was a sensitivity to light caused by an injury he got when the USS Bar Ran was destroyed, but we learned later in the season that sensitivity to light is actually a part of mirror universe biology. Emperor Giorgio described it as the singular biological difference between humans and Terrans from the Mirror Universe. This, as well as Lorca's over-the-top brutality and lack of trust or respect for his crew, greatly foreshadowed his eventual reveal as a Terran. Number 7. The Phasing Cloaking Device from the Pegasus in the Next Generation episode The Next Phase, Ro Laren and Geordi LaForge were pushed out of phase with ordinary space due to a transporter accident caused by an experimental Romulan phasing cloaking device. They were assumed dead, but really just became invisible to everyone but each other and were able to move through walls. While the Enterprise crew prepared their funerals, the two used their new abilities to spy on the Romulans and were eventually able to decloak themselves. But what many people may not have noticed is that this cloaking device actually appeared later in the series in the iconic episode The Pegasus. 
The Pegasus was a Starfleet ship that was experimenting with the same kind of phasing cloak technology as the Romulans in the next phase. Unfortunately, due to a treaty signed with the Romulans, Starfleet is banned from developing any kind of cloaking devices. So the project was classified and covered up until the deception was exposed by Captain Picard. Ronald D. Moore confirmed in an AOL chat in 1997 that the two cloaking devices were intended to be the same. Interphasic cloaking is a huge step up from a standard cloak because it not only renders a ship invisible, but also able to move through solid objects. Number 6. Kirk's Paradise in the Nexus when the Enterprise B was launched at the beginning of Star Trek Generations, Kirk, Scotty and Chekhov were invited to observe. After meeting Sulu's daughter Demora, Kirk was surprised that Sulu had the time to start a family while in Starfleet. Scotty responded to him, if something's important you make the time, and suggested that Kirk was feeling lonely in his retirement. This, as well as Captain Harriman remarking that he read about Kirk's adventures in grade school, made Kirk feel like his best years were behind him. He was upset that it was apparently too late for him to settle down and start a family like Sulu. This foreshadowed what happened to Kirk inside the Nexus later in the film. The Nexus allows those who enter it to live out their dreams for eternity in an unending state of pure bliss and happiness. For Kirk, this meant living at his old home, a rustic cabin in the woods on Earth, with his late dog Butler and his long-lost love Antonia. In the end, Kirk got to live out the dream he always wanted, but chose to sacrifice it to help Picard save the Viridian system. Number 5. Section 31's Involvement in the Dominion War when the Federation CIA-inspired secret intelligence agency Section 31 was first introduced in the Deep Space Nine episode Inquisition, their agent Luther Sloan attempted to recruit Julian Bashir. One of the main things Sloan kept discussing with Bashir was his controversial belief that the Federation should surrender from the Dominion War because of the inevitability of defeat. Sloan, a devout supporter of the Federation, of course disagreed, but he respected Bashir's willingness to speak his mind and come up with unorthodox solutions solutions to problems. This moment not only gave us the first appearance of Section 31, but also hinted at the organization's covert involvement in the Dominion War. While the main fleet was directly engaging enemy forces, Section 31 was behind the scenes working to ensure the survival of the Federation through any means necessary. Again, we're given a hint of this involvement in the episode Inter Arma Enem Sealant Legus, please don't judge my Latin attempt there, in which Sloane recruits Bashir to secretly gather intelligence on the Romulan Empire in order to keep them on the Federation's side of the war. These two episodes foreshadowed the eventual conclusion of the series, where Section 31 secretly developed the morphogenic virus in order to kill the entire changeling population. Number 4. Jadzia Dax's Death Jadzia Dax's death at the hands of Goldacad came as an utter shock to audiences. Jadzia was one of the most beloved characters on Deep Space Nine, and there was very little indication that she was going to be leaving the show. However, the writers knew for a while that Terry Farrell, who played Jadzia Dax, wanted to quit Deep Space Nine to attend auditions for new pilots. As preparations were made to write in the character's death, the writers snuck in a hint in the episode The Sound of Her Voice. At the end of the episode, the crew hosted a funeral for Lisa Cusack, and during O'Brien's eulogy, he said, The war changed us, pulled us apart. I want my friends in my life because someday we're going to wake up and we're going to find that someone is missing from this circle. And right as he said this, the camera cut to Jadzia and Worf. In the next episode, Tears of the Prophets, Jadzia was killed. So let's all thank O'Brien for preparing us for one of the most heartbreaking deaths in Trek. Number 3. The Existence of the Borg the Next Generation episode, The Neutral Zone, brought the Romulans into the new era of Star Trek, something Gene Roddenberry was originally reluctant to do, because he thought that The Next Generation should stand apart from the original series by focusing on newer aliens. However, the episode was also originally intended to introduce a new enemy to the Federation, the Borg. This plotline was eventually removed from the script due to time constraints, as well as a writer's strike going on at the time, and the Borg were not revealed until Q Who several episodes later. Later. Still though, there is evidence of the Collective's involvement in the plot of the Neutral Zone. Both the Romulans and the Federation were investigating their colonies near the Neutral Zone that were destroyed in an unknown fashion, and the two sides began to blame each other for the attacks, eventually reaching a compromise. When the Borg finally did appear in Q Who, the Enterprise D investigates a destroyed alien colony. Scans reveal that the damage is identical to what happened to the outposts along the Neutral Zone. So while the Borg were not actually mentioned in the episode, the Neutral Zone gave us a hint that a new threat was coming to the Alpha Quadrant. Number 2. The Existence of the Dominion 
In Deep Space Nine, the Dominion grew to become the Federation's biggest threat, perhaps aside only from the Borg. The Dominion War devastated the Alpha Quadrant and was one of the darkest times in the history of Star Trek. Although the Dominion was not encountered until the episode The Gem Hadar, near the end of Season 2, it's interesting to note that they were mentioned in Rules of Acquisition several episodes prior. Near the end of the episode, a visitor from the Gamma Quadrant offered to put Quark in touch with the Karama, who they said were an important power in the Dominion. Confused, Quark responded, The Dominion, what's that? And the aliens told him, Let's just say, if you want to do business in the Gamma Quadrant, you have to do business with the Dominion. This small scene foreshadowed the control of the Dominion over the Gamma Quadrant, and set them up as a terrifying and powerful force to be respected, before any Starfleet ship had even officially made contact with them. Number 1. The Year of Hell the two-parter Voyager episode Year of Hell is one of the darkest points in the series. A Delta Quadrant species known as the Krenim use a devastating time weapon to erase people, ships, and even entire civilizations from history. The episode shows us nearly a full year of Voyager struggling on the edge of destruction as they slowly lose all their power and resources, and several of the crew die. Fortunately, at the end of the episode, the Krenim time weapon exploded and erased itself from history, undoing the events of the episode. This this episode is praised for showcasing Voyager's darker side, something many fans thought was missing from the rest of the show. But many fans may have forgotten that Janeway was actually warned about the Krenim several episodes earlier. As Kess was jumping across different points in time in the Voyager episode before and after, she visited the ship during the Year of Hell. It was actually a chroniton torpedo launched from the Krenim, mixed with some techno babble involving a biotemporal chamber, that caused her time shifting. After Kess realigned with her original time, she warned Janeway about the Krenim and the Year of Hell, preparing them for what was to come. And that concludes our list. If you can think of anything that we missed, then do let us know in the comments below. And while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe and tap that notification bell. Also, head over to Twitter and follow us there, at Trek Culture. And I can be found across various social medias just by searching Ellie Littlechild. I've been Ellie with Trek Culture. I hope you have a wonderful day. And remember to boldly go where no one has gone before.